Welcome back to Beyond the Wrench. My name is Jay Ganinen, and I am your host. Today's guest is one that I've really gotten to know uh, over the last couple of years and somebody that I've got a tremendous amount of respect for, Jim Phillips from Training Team USA. Jim is one of the best consultants, advisors in, in this business. He is really, really talented at what he does. I've been lucky enough to be able to sit through some of his 20 group meetings. I was able to participate in one with him a few weeks back and is just uh, one of uh, one of the uh, really, really good people in this business. Now, Jim's background is all about the dealership side, right? A lot of NADA uh, background, a lot of uh, training background in general. I could go for, I think, days about your background, Jim, but I, I'll, I'll let uh, let you kind of take that when we dive into it. But how are you today? Uh, doing great. It is a great day here in Norfolk, Virginia. Well, it's a true pleasure for me to have you on here. As we record this, a few weeks back, I was able to take part in one of your 20 group meetings in Nashville and just had an absolute blast with you in in presenting to a 20 group and was able to see your style up close and personal right just being able to see how you command a room how you train people how you keep it really fresh and i think anybody that's presented in front of a group knows how challenging it's it is to uh, present directly after lunch or you know there's different times of the day that are very very difficult but you just have a mastery about that where, where you're able to, to command that room, uh, keep everybody focused and, and in tune. How did, how did you learn that? I mean, that, that is an incredible skill. Well, I, uh, I've, I've been a, a speaker all my life. I think I started uh, with the uh, kindergarten play. I think I, I was a uh, thespian all, uh, through, all throughout my years. But I, I've always enjoyed uh, public speaking, but I never really... Uh, thought that I would capitalize on that very much uh, because I um, I was going to be the Lincoln Mercury dealer in Norfolk, Virginia. That was my lot in life. I was uh, I am the son of a car dealer uh, in in Norfolk, Virginia. I grew up. I was one of those uh, dealer sons that grew up in the business and. I, and Jay, I'm sensitive to dealer son jokes, so please, no, no dealer son jokes. Um, but no, I, I, I grew up uh, watching the business, and actually started when I was really, really young. I would go out. My, my father worked. Uh, I guess one of the luxuries of being a, a dealer is you can do what you you wanted to do on Saturday, and he would go in for half a day, and in that half a day, he would take me and and leave it to the dealership people to babysit me because I was six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, and I would just roam freely on this uh, on this big lot and uh, and just loved it. It's all all I thought about. There was never any question about what I was going to do with my education. I was going into business with my dad and, um, and all through high school, all through college, I knew that, uh, you know, that's what I wanted to do and that's what I did. So, uh, when I graduated from, from college, I took a, um, a year in kind of a management uh, school with a, a dealership down in Florida. And then I, I came back and I, I, I went to work uh, in the Lincoln store. So I, I started kind of at a young age there only because, uh, I had just been in it for so long. I had just, um, uh, been around the business and, and I was interested in every department. I didn't discriminate. I, I loved them all. It didn't matter. Uh, so when I came back, it was interesting when I started uh, working kind of in the management in the dealership, uh, I was, gosh, I guess what, 20, 24 years old. And I was going around kind of in some of the different posts and some of the different managers spots. And I, I was at it for about, um, I, I guess for about a year kind of going down, there was a general manager that, that, um, that worked for my dad, who's, 
who really his job was he was close to retirement and his he really took uh his job of training me very seriously so he was a great mentor and uh lo and behold when i was a month shy of my 25th birthday he he passed away and my dad came to me and he said son look this is the deal you know you're you're uh uh, I, I'm not going to hire another general manager to run this place until you're ready. You've been training for this all your life. So here you go. You're in. Have a nice day. My office is behind us. And uh, and if you need me, I'll be in there. But, uh, you know, it, it's all yours and off you go. So I, I was a GM at a store when I was 25 years old and wow. had to rely on other people around to make it successful. So uh, I've kind of kept that uh, you, you have to engage your team, whether you're uh, wherever you are in the dealership, where, whether you're a general manager, a service manager, a, a, a technician, a foreman, a, whatever your role is in, in the dealership, you have to engage them. And I, I take that very seriously and I engage my audiences too. How important was it for you to go work for somebody else prior to coming back to the family dealership? You know, I I went to work. Uh, I, I got the job on my own. They didn't know who I was, but uh, I went to work for Holman Enterprises. Uh, uh, Mr. Holman, Joe Holman, a legendary dealer from Cherry Hill, uh, New Jersey, and was just uh, had a lot of uh, ownership and dealerships in South Florida, a lot of them up in the Jersey area, and still to this day, just a wonderful organization. I went down there literally spring break of my senior year and went to uh, my, my roommate uh, was looking to go down there because IBM had a plant uh, in in Boca Raton. And so he went down there and got a job on the same trip. I said, well, I'll just get a job selling cars. So it's February and I can't, so I've got to finish my senior year. So I've got to, I'm not going to start till August. Well, if you know anything about our business, you don't interview in February for a job, a sales job that starts in August. So <laughs> I'm interviewing for this, uh, for this uh, dealership. And it, it, what a great guy. His name was Ed Smith. And uh, I, I'm interviewing and he says, uh, he says, how old are you, son? I said, well, I'm 23 years old. And he says, well, and he says, look at the, he says, do you see that guy that just walked by? And I, I said, yes, sir. He, he said, um, uh, his name is Bud. And I said, yes, sir. He, he said, he's 52. I said, yes, sir. He said, he's the youngest of our salespeople that we have here. And, um, and with that, we talked a little bit. I kind of laughed it off. I didn't really see what he was saying. But after a while, he said, he said, I, I don't think you'd be a very good fit. I said, what, what do you mean? Why would I not have been in Lincoln Mercury business all my whole life? I mean, what do you mean? I'm not, I've been selling cars for, uh, during the, my summer vacations for the last three years. I mean, how, how could you say it's not a good fit? And he is like, well, I mean, I just, I just don't, I just don't think it's going to work. We have an older clientele. I said, Mr. Smith, how about this? If I don't sell 20 cars in the first month I'm here, I'll fire myself. And with that, he threw his hand across the desk and said, "Welcome to Pompano Lincoln Mercury." <laughs> <laughs> it was, and so in August I did start, and in August I did sell twenty. Uh, well, it was September. In September, I, I sold twenty. It was, it was so easy to sell Lincoln Mercury products because there were a lot of older clientele, and and uh, they were enjoying those cars. So, um, but I quickly found out that. It was it was very enlightening to go to work for another dealership that uh, was so strong on process. Uh, they literally at the time had what they called the Holman Bible. I mean, the, which uh, w was a written log of every process you could think of in the dealership. I mean, if you wanted to know how to do it, it was right there, and uh, it was amazing 
they, uh, I could see how they proliferated into so many different dealerships because they just had great process. And it was, everybody just, if, if you went outside that process, it was not going to look very good for you. I mean, they would listen to you, but they were, they pretty much had the way that they wanted to do it. But so it, it was a great, well-rounding experience. As a matter of fact, uh, after that first, I sold for, for two months and after winning the board or selling the most cars for several months in a row, that earned me breakfast at Denny's with the general manager as a, as a, and, and this was, this was a godlike spiritual, you, this has been bequeathed to you. This is to be, um, honored and, and it was, it was a great honor to go out with him. His name was Joe Chevroli. And when I went out with him, that's when I fessed up and I told him who I was and where I was and, and where I came from and kind of what I was planning on doing. And he said, he said, so what you really need, son, is you need to go around all the different, uh, ma you know, places in the dealership and really learn what's going on. And I said, Yes, sir. That's exactly what I want to do. And he said, well, I tell you what, I'll do that for you. I will, I will run you through every department. I'll do it for a year. And I only ask one thing of you. And I said, well, what is that? And he said, well, all you have, to, you earn what they earn. So if you're an assistant body shop manager, you earn what an assistant body shop manager. If you're a, a service advisor, you earn what a service advisor is. As long as that's okay with you, then I'm good. And I said, yes, sir, I'm good. The fact that you do that, I mean, I'm just, I'm honored. Thank you so much. He said, um, give me the keys to your demo. And I said, I reached in my pocket and I had, I had no other car. And I handed him the keys and he said, great. You're the assistant body shop manager. You make three hundred a week. <laughs> oh, what? Wait, what? What just happened? I mean, the month before, I made like fifteen grand or something, you know, selling cars, and now I'm an assistant body shop manager of my own volition. I asked for this, and you know, he says, "Give me a key," and he just laughed, and and that was it. And so I was on for three hundred a week. Um, but I mean, I tell you what a great education from a great, um, a, a, just great, a great dealer and a great place to be. So it was very cool. I think what you did so well there was you went through the process, right? And I think I was guilty of this when I was younger and I, I see it in a lot of young people right now where they're trying to rush that process. They're trying to rush to the top and without having that firm foundation of each department, you really don't know what you don't know, right? If you've never yeah. lived it, you've never gone through it, it's really hard to put yourself in their shoes if you just don't know. Well, I do get, uh, and I laugh about uh, dealer sons and dealer daughters jokes uh, be because some, uh, hey, some dealers, family are born with a silver spoon in their mouth and they're they're spoon fed the whole time um my father did not do that with me my father gave me opportunity and there is no question about that he gave me the opportunity but he let it be known that when i was doing it it better be more it better be higher it better be quicker it better be uh more profitable it better just to be average wasn't going to cut it. And, uh, so I was, I felt like I was always kind of uh, judged on a higher standard than everybody else. And I, I, I always ran through that. I worked hard. Uh, I started my career in, in a, um, in a time where you work bell to bell, key to key, um, you know, beginning to end. And that was just what everybody did. I, you know, and, and, and frankly, that's why a lot of people didn't like the car business. But it was also a time where you you were driving. If you were a salesperson, you were driving a demo, and um, gosh, you could you could make a six figure education with a, a six figure income with with a high school education. Um, so there were um, 
which led to quite the cast of characters. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and, sure there's some stories over the years. <laughs> and, uh, well, and they, you know, and there still are. And so, I mean, there, there. I mean, to to cut it in any kind of sales environment, you have to be a bit of a character, and that goes on uh, to today. But uh, but it was. It, I I actually ran that store for uh, for 15 years, and one day. Uh, we had we built a new store. We'd moved. We were were really in command of the of the marketplace. Uh, it was it was a great deal, very profitable. My dad came into my office one day and and uh, he had a a number on a uh, sticky note, and he put it on the corner of my desk. And he just kind of came in. He put this down. And I said, "What is that?" And he said, "That." is what the Ford dealer down the street will will pay for this franchise. And um, uh, it was a very large number and a number that uh, that you, you couldn't pay working in the dealership. I mean, you just couldn't. And I, and I kind of said, in one of the more regrettable things I've said in my life, I said, uh, hey, if you can get that kind of money, you ought to go ahead and sell, you know, knowing that my father wouldn't sell my birthright out from under me. Um, and, uh, of course, 30 days later, I was unemployed. <laughs> it turns out uh, he, he took it and ran. And, and it, the best thing in the world, because the demise of Lincoln came after that. And it, if we'd have stayed at it, we probably would have gone broke. So I, it was probably divine intervention. And, um, um, but here I was, um, at 39 years old, having run a dealership for 15 years and I was not ready to retire. And, uh, that's kind of when I found my way over to the parts and service business. I worked for, um, a parts company, uh, you know, working with, with parts managers, setting up parts departments. I did that for a couple of years and then found my way over to, uh, NADA as a 20 group moderator. Um, and which was just, you know, such fun, such a, such great career worked with NADA for a number of years with their 20 group program. And then as the director of education in the NADA Dealer Academy and another, just what a great organization. Really is. And I, I'm interested, was that really where you started to get that true, I guess, foundation of the fixed op side? I know you were in a dealership for all of that time. Yep. And I know, you know, fixed ops has become a little bit more of the, the sexy thing in dealerships than it used to be. I think when, when you were first coming into the dealership world and growing up in the dealership world, it, it wasn't that, was it? I mean, it, it was kind of the perceived, you know, kind of redheaded stepchild, right? Like you're, you're, the service department was kind of pushed in the back. Well, ours was very progressive. We did look at it a little differently. Um, and, and here's, my father was a big financial guy and I have, uh, I, I took over his love for financial statements and that might be one of the reasons I find myself training so much on financial statements because it's really not that hard. There are a lot of people that kind of try to make it hard. It's not that hard. It's buy low, sell high, pay attention. And it, it's it's yes there's a lot to read but once you um once you kind of know what you're you're reading it starts to get easier to see what is going on in a store and yes i did my every when my father installed me as gm in the dealership he said son i'm going to kind of let you do what you want to do but every month every single month we will go over your report card and your report card is our dealer financial statement. And I quickly found out that the answer to his questions should not be, I don't know. That's not going to work out well for me. <laughs> so, so I became a student of the financial statement. Well, when you're in 20 group, you're just looking at everybody's statement. And so you start to see the value of trends in my own business. 
I was just kind of a one hit wonder and I was looking at just my departments, but a service department in my dealership was expected to make a 20% profit, a body shop, 20% profit, used cars, 20%. All the department managers managed their department to a profit. That was their job. Uh, and if they didn't do that, well, that then it was my job to help them to do that. Uh, to help them figure out how to get to an acceptable level of profitability. So I've been coaching people on how to get to that level of profitability for, I mean, l literally my whole career. So, uh, but it's uh, with, with 20 group, the average 20 group consultant has like eight 20 groups. Well, that's 160 dealers. So if you're looking at 160 dealers and on all of their financial statements, they're, they're two to 3,000 numbers, you think, oh, that's, what, that's just going to rattle, that's going to hurt my brain. No, it doesn't because really it's easy to see the trends and it's easy to see who is performing and who's not. And then when you see people that aren't, you start to ask questions and it, it almost all the time, it's the same thing. <laughs> it's, it, it's, a, it's a lot of the same. I'm not saying it's cookie cutter, but I'm just saying the challenges are, the, there are no cookie cutter responses and there's no way to do it. This is how you should do service. There's not, not that. But when you see poor performance, the symptoms are, are almost universal. And I want to talk about that. One thing that I thought was very interesting that you said was uh, uh, something that I think I experienced in my career as well, which was when I started to manage multiple dealerships at the same time, uh, the, the more of the fixed op side, this was in the equipment business, but very similar in that you start to go through so many financial statements. I was trained the same way that you were where I don't know wasn't an answer. You better know, or you were in a lot of trouble. Yep. And it was crazy to me how the impact of seeing multiple financial statements together were because then it became so simple is that you're, you're going through a P and L and you, stuff just starts to stick out like a sore thumb. Like when you're going through it and you're like, Oh, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense here. Or if it's, you know, year to year or uh, based on what your budget was, uh, it, it just, it got really uh, fun for me to be able to look through that and see, you know, something that would stick out. And the way that I always approached it was that's where I started to ask questions of the managers that were working for me was that, I would go through a financial statement. This doesn't make sense. Why doesn't this make sense? And then you just start kind of peeling back the onion there because then you would start to get to, you know, we, we would have maybe a work order where the people would put, uh, we, I remember we had a line item that was sweeping and cleaning and that's where all of the extra time would get buried at, right? If you're, you know, right. if somebody's giving away sure. time to a customer or, you know, whatever, that's where that would get buried at. So mm -hmm. some months you'd see that number balloon and you would start to dig into it and start to look at work orders. Then you start to, you know, you really right. start to dive into it. And to me, that was, I really, really enjoyed that. It sounds like you kind of had a similar experience in, in really diving into that. Well, Jay, you're exactly right. It, it, when you're looking at a dealership and especially when you're looking at a lot of them you see that some need to be tweaked just just a little here and a little there look at an expense yeah one month all of a sudden something gets out of line you know, it sounds like you're describing today's version of unapplied labor or adjusted cost of labor and if you're uh and if that all of a sudden gets out of hand well there are reasons for that that like maybe we hired a bunch of new technicians and we just have to pay them. Okay, well, that's all right. Um, uh, but you should know that. But there's some dealerships that are just broken. Like everywhere you look, 
none of the numbers make sense. Everywhere you turn, there's a problem. And then when you go to fix, it's a it's another problem and another problem and another problem. And then that's when you have to say, okay, all right, time out here. Let let's start over and let's make sure that everybody has a vision. Let's 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 reevaluate our core. Let let's apply our culture if there is one. There, there's some that run without a culture and run without um, general leadership. Uh, of a culture, just kind of we're nice guys with the best buys and, you know, that kind of, you know, things that we say, not what we do. And, uh, but, but that's okay. Uh, there are many average dealerships in the U S that do very well. And especially for the last few years, they've done well. So I, I, I'm not knocking it, but you'll see in, in a, uh, 20 group setting, a general manager or a dealer where there are just so many numbers that are off the metric. And and then it, 20 group moderators hear literally every excuse in the world. Uh, literally every excuse in that you could ever dream of. Uh, I mean, way beyond just it was the start of hunting season and all my techs left that day and way beyond uh, we were crappie fishing in, in Arkansas, way beyond wow, the weather was bad. I, I mean, literally, you hear them all. Um, but after a while, when those people start giving you those, those uh, excuses and the group starts looking at you at some time, it's like, uh, Jay, are you are you seeing this might be you? <laughs> it might be the man behind the microphone. You know, it it might be. Um, uh, our technicians used to have a joke about um, uh, somebody who d- couldn't really describe what the repair was. They said it might be a loose nut behind the wheel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know if I've heard that one. That's pretty good. So a, it, it could be in this dealership. There's a loose nut behind the wheel. I, I don't know. Uh, so how hard is it at that point to where when, when you walk into a dealership and for those of you that don't know, Jim, Jim is an expert at turning around dealerships. And when you're walking into a dealership and maybe the numbers are so far off that they just don't make any sense at all. It's hard to even look at those numbers or I have to imagine it's hard to look at those numbers and get anything out of it because there's just, it's so off that it doesn't make any sense in any scenario. And obviously then you got to start picking that apart. But I I've gone into scenarios like that before. And you know, you, you have your KPIs and you have the different benchmarks that you're shooting for, but when they're so far off, yeah. that it, it just doesn't make sense. You almost have to throw the data out the window and start over again, don't you? Well, that's when we get the call. We we get the call. Again, you don't you don't need me for, for tweaking. If you're going to tweak it, go tweak it. Um, but if one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, like uh, we have we have a, a, a technician throughput issue and, and we have – uh, an issue with express uh, versus main shop, uh, but then the writers can't write up, and then you've got inexperience over here, and you don't have it. Whereas literally everywhere you turn in a shop, you kind of have to start over. That's when I get the the call. When when people get the vision of okay, I I, I see where we want to go, I see what we have to do, but I just don't think that I can do it. Uh, myself. Um, Jay, I get called from a lot of manufacturers that say, Jim, we want you to talk on, on this subject. And I look, I'm not a talking head. Nobody says to Jim Phillips, Hey, Jim, I want you to come and say this, 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 and this. They're like, Jim, I want you to talk on, on the subject. There are things that I can say that maybe they can't say. Um, and, uh, and, and that's in dealerships too. That when I go in, I'm like, come on, everybody, let's look. Here, here's the results of what's been happening. Now, can you see that because we're acting this way, we're getting this result? And they're like, yeah, I can. Well, okay. Well, that's okay. All that's, uh, nobody's judging. It is what it is. Let's just change it. Let's figure out a way to change it. 
And once everybody realizes that I'm not there to fire everybody, I'm not there to fire anybody. I'm there to get the people that are there to start heading towards a goal. And I don't even know what that goal is. That goal is not set by me. That's set by the dealership. I encourage them to have step goals where we could take one step, we take the next step, we take the next step. I mean, Rome wasn't built in a day, but but it was being built every day. So you, you, you've got to just be moving towards a goal. And if you are that person that doesn't want to move to the goal and you don't like change and you do like it the way it's been for a hundred years, well then... You know, you, there are openings at down the road motors and, uh, you, you may be invited to apply. <laughs> if you're enjoying beyond the wrench, remember to follow and rate our podcast to help support the show right now. We would like to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Sonic tools, Sonic tools, direct distribution model of offers affordable prices without sacrificing quality and service. Their goal is to increase the efficiency of every technician with the equipment solutions and the Sonic foam system that organizes quality tools in ways that award every technician with the opportunity to excel. Visit sonictoolsusa.com to learn more. <clears throat> is there anything that you see as almost a trend or a theme when you're walking into a dealership and and you're starting to analyze them and you're you're just kind of getting a feel for what might be going wrong why you got the call in the first place is there any commonality of things that you see yeah. when you walk in the doors so it all starts on the drive a lot of people ask me jay what, what you know jim where do you start start on the service drive start by uh greeting people with a smile by doing walk arounds at the car geography matters uh don't have people get out of their car and come in to the um uh you know inside to your computer um it, it, we always do better with the customer when we're with them at the car with a and preferably with a tablet um I remember going to a um, a store in Anchorage, Alaska, and I remember the people at NADA laughed at me because I, I was the guy that would never say no, and uh, I didn't say no when uh, uh, when I was there was an opportunity to go to uh, Alaska in February. Well, if you've never been to Alaska in February in Anchorage, Alaska, I mean it's c c c cold, <laughs> like really cold. Well, so I go off to, to Alaska and, uh, they were not selling much with the car because the customer would come inside and the porter would take their car and go and park it. And I said, you guys need to write the car up at the car. And they didn't have an inside area where they could do that. And they, I said, well, if you don't have it inside, you, you, you'll have to do it outside. And they, they said, Jim, you know, it's minus 20 out there, right? I mean, I mean, did, did that escape you? And the, and I said, all right, I, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. I said, whenever it thaws out around here in August or whenever it gets warm enough so you can do something around here, I want you to promise me that for four weeks in a row, you will, with every car that comes in, you will go out to the car and walk around the car and write it up. And they said, well, I mean, why wow, it's just so punitive. I said, it's not punitive. I said, what will happen is you'll all get a raise because you'll sell more just by accident. Well, a few months go by and um, it was coming up to the holiday season and I got a Christmas card from one of the people in Anchorage, Alaska. It was a picture of a guy and they did not have a tablet. They had a clipboard because the tablets would probably freeze out there, but the guy had a <laughs> clipboard 
and he was standing next to a customer and he had one of those uh, coats on. They don't sell them in Virginia, but it looks like an Eskimo. You know, it has all the fur on it. We have those in Wisconsin. Oh, you do? Okay, you do have that. Yeah, we we have in North Virginia. They don't sell many of those. But he had his big uh, Eskimo coat on and wrapped up with a scarf and the and the customer was wrapped up with a scarf. And he's standing there next to a car with a clipboard and the caption said, Jim, thanks, we're still at the car. And what they That's learned cool. was it didn't matter how cold it was. If it was too cold, they should go inside. It all starts on the drive. On the drive is where you get to have a consultative relationship with a customer and talk to them about their car, about what's going on. You're asking them the same question that your doctor does when you go for a physical. They say, hey, what's going on? What's happening? What's going on? Let me... Let me let me hear a little about you and what's going on. And 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 now there are a hundred ways to do that, and those ways are um, uh, limited by the geography that you have. If you have one lane, two lanes, no lanes. If you have, you know, depending on the kind of customers, there's different setups. But always start on the drive with the customer, giving the customer a good customer experience in about three to four minutes you, a, a, to do it right uh, most advisors will tell you if a customer came into your dealership and you were going to check their history and uh, look at recalls and you were going to add them to their system and you were going to walk around their vehicle and you were going to open an RO, they would tell you eight to 10 minutes. We don't have eight to 10 minutes. We have three to four minutes and we have a line. So we have to use tools and they're out there. We have to have tools so that we can get the cars through and that we can get the people through and offer them needed services professionally when they get there. And almost universally, when you see some uh, a dealership that is poorly performing, that is an issue. How hard is it with when you're, when you're training – and it starts on the drive there, yet service advisor turnover is worse than technician turnover, right? And uh, when a lot of these dealerships, that we, we were lucky enough to have a, have a podcast at one point where we talked about the importance of service advisors and how important they are to a dealership. And I don't know that they get the credit maybe they deserve a lot of times because they're the only people in the dealership that are working with management. They're working with the technicians. They're working with the customers. They're working with everybody. And it truly feels like we eat them up and spit them out. You know, we, we just keep hiring them. And I think these dealerships do such a almost disservice to themselves because when they're churning through service advisors, it's really hard for that customer to have that, that same experience. And I've seen the damage it does to a group of technicians when a really good service advisor leaves and it makes their life a lot more miserable. Yeah. yeah. They're important. Uh, they're important and it is uh the most stressful job in the dealership, I would say. May Maybe the dispatcher comes in at a little higher level of stress because just everybody is always tugging at the dispatcher as a as one person. But as far as a job that uh, several uh, 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 the service writer is a high stress, long hour, um, uh, poorly rewarded. It, it it a lot of times it's poorly rewarded. And because it's poorly rewarded, it turns because it's like, I don't, I, I don't think I signed up for all this stress and it is a stressful job. So I would, um, but if you, um, if you see a service manager that goes over and works side by side with somebody, like if I said to you, Hey Jay, come on, let's do this together. Let's you write it up. Do you want me to write it up and you watch, or you want to write it up and I'll watch? It doesn't matter. Come on, let's do this together. And and I don't know. 
this is not a an unusual concept because it happens with with uh, servers and waiters and across the country it happens in all kinds of jobs but yet when it, when you go to those stores and there's really high turnover, you ask them the last time that they had some coaching or the last time that they had some training, just of any kind. Uh, I mean, aside from the, the, the factory, you know, one or two hour snippets that are, uh, that are uh, you know, videos that they have to watch or something like that. But when did they really have somebody work side by side with them and say, hey, Jay, love the way you wrote that car up. Now, l let's let's go back, though, and let's look at a couple of opportunities where you you might have. Um, you know, you, you might have done something a little bit different. But see, Jay, you're only going to do that with me if you trust me, if the culture says it's okay to do that. And I, I've listened to some of the people that you've had on the, the podcast, and they've talked about that culture and what the culture is of the, you know, of their organizations and, and your uh, Lisa Kelly, who was on, uh, you know, she almost made me cry. Um, <laughs> she was good. <laughs> she is doing there. It's just such, such great work that she's doing. She so gets it. But she gets coaching. And, and coaching is, I, I think that's the big reason that they leave, is that there's no coaching. There's, there's little management. Um, there's a pile of stuff to do. So it's just a matter of what's not going to get done. So um, because no one has really coached them or managed them, they become unorganized. They say things that they shouldn't say. They um, they maybe come across to a customer the, the way they shouldn't. And the fact is, I, I really don't want to talk to a customer, so I'm going to kind of act like I'm on the phone or I'm going to act like I'm doing something else so I don't have to look at them. And this is a real phenomena. Um, so whenever you see that, that is a management issue. I, in my classes, and I don't know if you remember this from, from uh, a few weeks ago, I don't know if it happened there, but... Um, some people think it's weird when I invite them to um, uh, excuse themselves to the restroom. But wherever I go, uh, it, there's a big full mirror in the restroom. And sometimes I ask them to go and have a talk with the person responsible for that. Excuse themselves to the restroom and, and go have a sales meeting with the person who's in charge. Uh, because, you know, it's a lot of service managers don't see that as one of the things they have to do is to coach, to mentor, to manage, to watch, and to go side by side. And the reason they don't, Jay, is because they're out of practice. They're scared that if they wrote the customer up, it, it, it wouldn't go right or it wouldn't be perfect. In other words, they're not vulnerable themselves. And so um, the best thing that um, look everybody knows how to write up a car there's no there's no secret sauce there are many super trainers with great methods that are very successful don't get me wrong but this is about just getting along with people and acting like you really <laughs> want them to service their car here i mean this is not uh, a rocket science deal and while i know that some sales trainers have been very successful with word tracks. I always like to have somebody write up their own word track. I'll give them a word track, but I don't want, I want this to sound like you, not sound like me or sound like somebody else. I don't want to use words that you don't use. I, I want it to sound like you. So let's make it sound like you. Let's make you comfortable. But there are certain things that you must ask and you must say during the process. So um, I don't find it very hard to get people to come on board with them, uh, with, with me and, and trainers that go in and train. It's actually pretty easy. It's kind of like, Jay, let's see what you do. Uh, let's do it together. 
and I'll show you yours if you show me mine. You know, I'll, I'll show you mine yeah. if you show me yours, and and let's go and let let's see if we can get better together. So. I appreciate that approach, and I I think I was lucky early on to have a mentor that allowed me that autonomy or that freedom to be able to be myself. And I remember in my very first job, I went in and I had the impression that, you know, you've got to be buttoned up, polished, professional, and there really wasn't a lot of fun in it. Right. It was just right. You know, business, business, business. Right. And it wasn't until I had that mentor walk up to me and, and tell me, you know, and I'm in my early twenties at that point, Hey, I've, I've seen your personality, you know, when we go out for drinks or when we're, you know, just at, at lunch, why don't you be that guy when you're working? And it like clicked for me. It was like, you know what? I can have fun at work and I can be myself and have, you know, show my personality. And it was one of the most impactful things that happened over the course of my career. And had that person come in and said, read from this script, do not go away from this script. I would have failed miserably because I'm not that kind of person. I don't think there are a lot of people that are that just want to be a robot and when you get the chance to be yourself and show off your personality, I think that's where your strengths shine. I think that's where you're more comfortable, where you're having more fun at work. And I am forever grateful for having that person come up to me and just say, just relax, be yourself, yeah. have fun. Yeah. And it changed it changed the game for me. Well, and 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 that people should have fun at work and they should relax but they should be accountable to yes. process. And what happens is our our business is a business that applauds and rewards the gunslinger. The people the people that can sell you out of your own shoes. I mean those people that have just mad skills for selling on the drive. Why? Because they're survivors. Nobody told them, nobody coached them, nobody mentored them and they just sell like crazy. Well, what happens is they sell like crazy, and I'm not saying they sell the wrong way or that they're using methods that are untoward, but when you're trying to get everybody to get to some sort of process, like let's just decide we're going to do it this way, like we're going to write them up this way, we're going to walk around this way, and then and then you get to the gunslinger and you say, well, none of that applies to you, and, and then it's hard, it's hard to manage a a service drive and so uh and it's because of the gunslingers and we have them in sales and we have them in service and i sense that the industry is going to go to more more process oriented uh people that that aren't robots and aren't it's not that they're not having fun but they're look there there's certain things that we'll call them non-negotiables like we need to do this, and this, and this, and this, um, and and we want to have fun doing it. We're kidding around, and and but uh, let's uh, let let's put some process to it. So uh, I appreciate that too, and I think that you know if, when you can you can walk kind of that fine line of knowing you know use their personality, their strengths, but also follow the process, follow the way that we do things because that's not going to get you in trouble, right? Like that, right. that's the stuff that it, it, like you said, the non-negotiables, uh, I think it's, yeah. and honestly, a lot of times for that employee that's out there, it's just knowing the non-negotiables, right? I think yeah. there's a lot of managers yeah. or leaders that they have it in their head that things should be done a certain way, but maybe they don't communicate it very well and it ends up on frustration with both sides. Yeah, you're 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 exactly right, and and this is where and this is where where I heard Lisa talking last week. She said I, I was very interested to listen to her say, "Well, I, there's some uh, dealerships that I, I or, or some places I, I just won't go there." And I, I was, "Well, wow, this is going to be good." What's she getting ready to say now? And, and she said, "Because that they're they're not interested in the culture. They're not interested in what it takes to really help." a an employee grow help an associate and a team member get to where they need to be and and that 
man, so spot on because that's if if you show me a service manager who's committed to the team really growing, not I don't want to hold you back. I mean, yes, they're a process and they're non negotiables, but they're not like hundreds of them. They're just like every time we want to offer this. For instance, on the service drive, it doesn't matter it it doesn't matter almost it doesn't matter what. Uh when a consumer comes in, we should offer them what the manufacturer recommends for their vehicle at that mileage interval. Uh, almost without I mean if they were in yesterday and something happened they came in today. I'm not saying don't use your head, but I'm just saying when somebody comes in, we should offer them. We should say, "Oh, Jay, how many car miles are on your car? 40,000. Great. At 40,000, the manufacturer recommends that you do this. Do you want us to go ahead and take the care of that while it's here?" I mean, that's an example of what I'm calling a non-negotiable in the process. We should we should always 100% of the time offer that who doesn't want to maintain their car like the owner's manual says. I mean, that's like an easy yes, it's an easy win. But so many service advisors are are running at the speed of retail. They just literally don't have time and so some of these things just start getting swept swept under the carpet, you know. Is your shop looking to fill open positions or grow your bench of candidates? Consider adding Wrenchway to your recruiting efforts. Wrenchway helps shops and dealerships all across the U.S. find better qualified candidates for their service centers. Wrenchway Top Shop memberships are only $150 per month and include unlimited job postings on the best job board in the industry, a guarantee of 10 qualified applicants, and the shops choose who is considered qualified, access to connect with and help over 650 high schools and post-secondary schools, and much more. Learn more about Wrenchway's Top Shop memberships by visiting Wrenchway.com and selecting the Four Shops tab under the Solutions dropdown. Link is in the show notes. You've been fortunate to see a lot of dealerships over the years, and we talked about culture a couple times here. Uh, we've brought that that word up, and I always love talking about it because I think it's one of the one of the biggest issues, and even as you were talking right there, I'm like, so much of this comes down to hiring the right person and the right personality for your shop, because if you try to fit a square peg into a round hole, oftentimes that's where you're going to struggle with that process because yeah. it just maybe doesn't fit right, or you know that that person doesn't fit in with your group right, and I think there's a lot of a lot of issues, uh, a lot of issues in a shop or a dealership that could be solved by just, you know, doing that higher, slow, fire, fast type of mentality. Right. And I think yeah. the hiring slow I, every in that phrase, I think everybody focuses on the fire fast, but that hiring slow is so important and making sure that you get that right person in there, isn't it? Well, it, it is. And it, it's oftentimes I go to dealerships and the culture is defined by the service manager. And the reason it's defined by the service manager is because there's weak leadership as general management and or a dealer that, you know, they have a home in Florida and they're here six months a year. And look, I, I, I'm not hating on that. I'm just saying that that they and they've had a successful business for a long time. Uh, so but they they're there's nobody saying here's who we are and how we act every day and general managers are just kind of not maybe hanging out more in sales than service and then so what happens is this the service guy is is the culture so the way that that person acts becomes the culture of the service department now and and that can be for good or it can be for bad, depending on the person and their confidence in themselves, uh, their confidence in, in their ability to lead, mentor, and their skill set. Um, because, I mean, sometimes service departments are broken merely because the leadership is, is, is just posing and, and trying, to, trying to hold it together until I get my next job. We can sniff that out in about three seconds. So, 
it's not very hard, uh, you know, to see that. But it is the cult, and and I see it, conversely. I'll see some. Uh, I w- went to a store not long ago where 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 I had a pretty good preconceived notion of what their values and their culture was because they were a large dealership group. And when I got there, you know, the general manager said, man, I don't know what they're smoking at headquarters. We don't act that way in our market here. We do it like this. And I was like, Oh my gosh, if they, if they heard that at headquarters, man, they, this guy would be working for down the road motors like tomorrow. But so there it, it's, where is the torch lit? Hopefully in a dealership, it's with the dealer principal, the general manager, carries that torch and everybody knows um that who we are and what we act like and that is one thing with with my father that uh, there was absolutely positively no question uh who we are how we act uh and what uh, and what we act like around customers and and what we're going to do and uh and that going back to kind of where the heart is the culture is about you know where the heart is and if the heart's in the right place hey we make mistakes but your heart's in the right place so let's get over it and let's let's keep moving on as opposed to there isn't really a set of guiding principles there really isn't a culture and i don't think you're doing that well so how about get out you know it's just a very different atmosphere so we we were lucky enough to have the author Dan Bradison who wrote a book called Seeds of Culture on the podcast a few weeks back and i just absolutely loved the way that he summarized culture in a way that was easy to comprehend and he he just said the way that i define culture he wrote this in the book as well the way that i define culture is the way we do things around here and when he said that it was like i think we have such trouble in not just the automotive or diesel or the transportation business in general, but businesses in general struggle with that of like, okay, I know what culture is. I feel it, but I don't really know how to put it into words. And when he said the way we do things around here, I'm like, that kind of clicked with me and it it makes a lot of sense. And it kind of echoes a lot of what you just said there. Right. Well, there's an old adage that says things that interest my boss fascinate me. So <laughs> if, if my boss says, here's the culture, this is who we act and who we are, I, it's going to be pretty easy for me to. Now, it's if, if I work for a boss that says one thing and does another, again, you see that in about five seconds. But if you have a boss that's committed to this and committed to the culture, it's so easy to rally around that because that's what people want to do. That's your natural propensity if you're working in a dealership. So um, it's when a service manager shines the light on whatever it is we're trying to fix, whether it's the service drive, whether it's technician throughput, uh, whether it's proficiency or organization or training, whenever they shine the light and they say this is what i believe is important and this is what i want to work on it's amazing how people rally around that because they say okay here's my leader my leader is is saying that this is important and this is where we're going and so come on man let's get on the train let's let's go and i i i started working with a, a dealership just five or six months ago that was losing a lot of money and every month. And once they kind of got the vision of where they wanted to go, man, it was easy. And I, I, I really didn't do anything except share that vision. And then, and then it's like, okay, we got that. What's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? And they just gobble it up and they go. Um, so it's, it's highly rewarding. This is a great, uh, job that I have and an opportunity to have with people uh, day in and day out and to get to interact with folks like you too. So uh, it, it is very cool to hear those stories. I, I love hearing those stories and those success stories of our industry. And one of the ways that you drive that success is through 20 groups. And I do want to spend a few minutes talking about 20 groups because I am a gigantic believer in 20 groups. I think they are one of the most impactful things in our industry 
because it does bring brain power together. It does bring collaboration together. It does so much. And one of the things I really enjoyed about your style of moderating a 20 group was how you made the 20 group think. And uh, the example that I'm thinking of was you talked about trying to evaluate a shop in, in really trying to understand the bay efficiency, the, uh, the technician, do I need to add another technician? But you didn't just give them the answer. You, you really posed it in numbers, right? You kind of posed yeah. the question in numbers. And I absolutely loved the way you approached that because even for me, I'm sitting back there and I'm thinking through things and I'm thinking through the numbers that you put out there. I'm like, this is really good stuff because this is real. This is real stuff. And I'm trying to make a decision in my head. And the way that you you frame that was very impactful. So uh, walk me through that a little bit, like the the number side and being able to tell a story and that kind of side of it. Well, so, again, I came from a as a general manager, uh, a service manager that worked with me, their job would be to create a 20% profit on the bottom line. And so we were always looking at all of those elements that add to revenue. And we were always looking at that. And I always, because I am a student of the financial statement, I sometimes look at it like it's a big math problem. And I found the number one question that I get in all of consulting that I do is do I have the right number of team members? And that's in sales, it's in service. Do I have enough salespeople? Do I have enough technicians? Do I have enough service advisors? And what I've found with many service managers is when you tell them, you say, hey, you you need to hire some technicians. Some of them look in the eye and they say, look, you know, I know consultants are a little, you know, they sometimes are not thinking because it's conventional wisdom. Everybody knows you can't hire technicians. Come on, man. You can't hire techs. What are you talking about? And and some service managers literally say that and take their hands off the wheel of profitability. They say, okay, well, because I can't hire techs, we can't achieve the profits. And the point of that exercise that you were were talking about is to say, oh, no, 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 no. You can't just say, well, conventional wisdom is you can't hire techs because there are other levers that you can pull. For instance, you could take the techs that you have now and get more throughput from them by making life easier for them to stay in their bay instead of waiting on parts or instead of um, the other things that stop them from working, not enough computers, not enough equipment, broken down stuff, um, uh, poor parking, no key control. All of these things are, okay, why don't we do that? If you say we can't hire techs, well, then what I want to hear you do is let's talk about the things that we can do to improve the techs that we have now. And if you say, well, I can't do that. Well, okay, if you can't do that, then I guess you're going to have to raise the rate. Uh, You can charge people more or you can begin to offer needed services and quit selling the cheap stuff, the people that come in, hey, I just want an oil change, you can ask them if they'd like fries with that. You can ask them if they'd uh, like uh, their air filter change or ask them if they would like to um, uh, do what the factory recommends that they do in that mileage interval. So we could, theoretically, we could lower expenses. We could say, hey, let's, let's lower an expense over here. Um, we, we can raise the rate. We could, we could open maybe longer hours, maybe get another hour here or an hour that all, all the the whole point of that litany is to say, don't give up. Don't just say, I can't hire techs and I'm done. You're always, if you need techs, you need to hire techs. But if you, if you need a technician or two, there are things that you can do today that will, will help you until you're able to hire a tech. And it's just math. It's just math. 
Um, so if you can't hire a tech, look at the things that you can do around the store that would help techs. And that's going to probably help you hire them anyway. Yes, it will. And I, I just think that is beautiful advice. I think that's applicable to anybody that's going to listen to this podcast and very, very helpful because what that math shows you is that there are options. It's not just the one thing that you can do. There are a bunch of different things that you can do to change your luck in your shop. And, and uh, I think yeah. the way that you summarize that in a fairly brief amount of time it was very eloquent and it was very well done, uh, just like the rest of the podcast and everything else that you do. So I uh, unfortunately, we're up on our time. This hour went insanely fast, as I expected it would. But I can't thank you enough for spending the time with me here today. I always enjoy the conversations that we have. I always come away learning something and uh, just hope hope you keep doing this because you, you are just uh, absolutely amazing at it. And, and I really, really appreciate everything you do for all those dealers out there. Well, Jay, thanks for inviting me today. It was great being with you. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Happy holidays. That wraps up this week's episode of Beyond the Wrench. Be sure to tune in next week for another brand new episode. As a reminder, don't forget to rate and follow Beyond the Wrench on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps us get Beyond the Wrench in front of other fantastic shop owners, managers, technicians, and dealers just like you, so we can continue to help improve, promote, and grow this amazing industry. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll be back next week. 